Hello, everyone. I'm delighted to be with you today to talk about Hong Kong's insider dealing regime under the Securities and Futures Ordinance and the changes that will be made to expand its scope following the SFC's publication of its consultation conclusions on the 8th of August 2023. The Securities and Futures Ordinance contains civil and criminal market misconduct offences under parts 13 and 14 of the SFO. These cover six types of market misconduct, insider dealing, false trading, price rigging, disclosure of information about prohibited transactions, disclosure of false and misleading information, inducing transactions and stock market manipulation. Part 14 of the SFO contains three additional criminal offences under sections 300 to 302, which have no civil equivalent under Part 13 and fall outside the definition of market misconduct. These are using fraudulent or deceptive devices in transactions in securities, futures or leveraged exchange trading, disclosing false or misleading information inducing others to enter into leveraged foreign exchange contracts, and falsely representing dealings in futures contracts on behalf of others. Civil cases of market misconduct are dealt with by the Market Misconduct Tribunal, while criminal cases go before the courts. As I'll talk about later, the SFC can also apply to the Court of First Instance under Section 213 of the SFO for various orders against someone who has committed market misconduct. In recent years, Section 213 has become the SFC's preferred means of obtaining compensation for investors who've suffered loss as a result of insider dealing. So what is insider dealing? Well, in broad terms, insider dealing happens when a person connected with a Hong Kong listed company, for example, a director or a staff member, has privileged information which could impact the company's share price, which when it becomes publicly known and trades, or they procure someone else to trade the company's securities or derivatives so as to make a profit or avoid a loss before the information becomes publicly available, or a person obtains information from someone else they know to be connected with a listed company and trades or procures another person to trade in the company's securities or derivatives so as to make a profit or avoid a loss before the information becomes publicly available. The SFO's definition of insider dealing in sections 270 and 291 of the SFO sets out seven circumstances which constitute the offence of insider dealing. A person with inside information deals in shares of a corporation with which they are connected. The first situation constituting insider dealing happens under sections 271A and 291A, when a person connected with a listed company has information which they know is inside information in relation to that company, and they deal in the company's listed securities or their derivatives, or in those of a related corporation, or they counsel or procure another person to deal in those listed securities or derivatives, knowing or having reasonable cause to believe that the other person will deal in them. This is the classic case of insider dealing. Takeover offers. So the second situation in which insider dealing can happen is in the context of a takeover offer, when a person who's contemplating or has contemplated making a takeover offer for a listed company and knows that the information that the offer is contemplated or is no longer contemplated is inside information, either deals in the company's listed securities or their derivatives, or in those of a related corporation, otherwise than for the purpose of the takeover, or that person counsels or procures another person to deal in those listed securities or derivatives, otherwise than for the purpose of the takeover. The provision is designed to stop, for example, a director of a company which is about to launch out a takeover bid from telling their friends to buy shares in the intended target in order to make a profit when the price of those shares rises. However, it doesn't stop the bidder's directors from buying the target company's shares or counselling or procuring others to buy them in what's known as a dawn raid, where the sole purpose of these purchases is to facilitate the takeover itself. The provision is also designed to catch, say, a director of the bidder who short sells the target company's shares when they know, but the public does not know, that the bidder is not going to increase its offer price at the end of the initial offer period, but will instead let the offer lapse. The third situation, which will amount to insider dealing, is where a person connected with a listed company has information which they know is inside information in relation to the company, 
and discloses the information directly or indirectly to another person, knowing or having reasonable cause to believe that the other person will use the information to deal or cancel or procure another person to deal in the company's listed securities or their derivatives or in those of a related corporation. This is designed to catch those who deliberately leak confidential information with a view to someone, the person tipped off or a third party, using that information to make a favourable deal trading the securities on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. Insider dealing also occurs when a person who is contemplating or has contemplated making a takeover offer for a listed company and knows that the information that the offer is contemplated or no longer contemplated is inside information, discloses the information directly or indirectly to another person, knowing or having reasonable cause to believe that the other person will use the information to deal or to cancel or procure another person to deal in the company's listed securities or their derivatives or in those of a related corporation. Insider dealing can also be committed when a person has received information from another person if they know that the information is inside information relating to the listed company, that the person is connected with that company and they know or have reasonable cause to believe that the person held that information because of their connection with the company. The offence of insider dealing will be committed if the person deals in the company's listed securities or their derivatives, or in those of a related corporation, or cancels or procures another person to deal in those listed securities or their derivatives. This covers the recipient of leaked information who uses it either by dealing himself or by cancelling or procuring someone else to deal. The person who actually leaks the information would be caught by sections 271C and 2913. The fact that the identity of the connected person who leaked the information is unknown does not prevent the person who actually deals on the basis of the inside information being convicted under this section. Insider dealing also occurs when a person has received information from a person they know or has reasonable cause to believe is contemplating or no longer contemplating making a takeover offer for a listed company when they know that the information is inside information in relation to the company. The offence occurs if the person who has received the information, who is sometimes called the TIPE, deals in the company's listed securities or their derivatives or in those of a related corporation or cancels or procures someone else to do so. This provision catches the recipient of the leaked information who uses it either by dealing himself or by counselling or procuring someone else to deal. The person who actually leaks the information would be covered by sections 271D and 2914. Insider dealing can also happen when a person who knowingly has inside information in relation to a listed company in any of the circumstances set out in subsection 271 and subsections 2911-6 and that person either counsels or procures another person to deal in the company's listed securities or their derivatives or in those of a related corporation and knows or has reasonable cause to believe that the other person will deal in those listed securities or derivatives outside Hong Kong on an overseas stock market or discloses the inside information to another person knowing or having reasonable cause to believe that they or some other person will use the inside information to deal or counsel or procure another person to deal in the company's listed securities or their derivatives or in those of a related corporation outside Hong Kong on an overseas stock market. These provisions on dealing outside Hong Kong on an overseas stock market extend the scope of the insider dealing regime to dealings in securities that are due listed in Hong Kong and on an overseas market. For this final type of insider dealing only, the SFO extends the mens rea element, the intention element. The person disclosing the inside information must know or have reasonable cause to believe that the person to whom the inside information has been disclosed or some other person will use the inside information. One of the amendments that's going to be made to the SFO's insider dealing provisions will extend this mens rea intention element to the other types of insider dealing that take place through disclosure of inside information. So let's look at the definitions. While securities are broadly defined in part one of Schedule 1 to the Securities and Futures Ordinance and include shares, stocks, 
debentures, loan stocks, funds, bonds or notes of or issued by or which it's reasonably foreseeable will be issued by a body, whether incorporated or unincorporated, or a government or municipal government authority, rights, options or interests, whether described as units or otherwise, in or in respect of any of these, and certificates of interest or participation in temporary or interim certificates for receipts for or warrants to subscribe for or purchase any of the items mentioned. The definition also includes interests in collective investment schemes, any interest, rights or property commonly known as securities, and structured products not falling in with the instru- within the instruments I've just mentioned. A structured product is then defined as an instrument under which some or all of the return or amount due or both the return and the amount due or the method of settlement is determined by reference to one or more of changes in the price value or level or a range within the price value or level of any type or combination of types of securities, commodity index, property, interest rate, currency exchange rate or futures contract or changes in the price value or level or a range within the price value or level of any basket of more than one type or any combination of types of securities, commodity index, property, interest rate, currency exchange rate or futures contract, or the occurrence or non-occurrence of any specified event or events, excluding an event or events relating only to the issuer or guarantor of the instrument or to both the issuer and the guarantor. The definition of structured products also includes regulated investment agreements and any other property or interest that the SFC prescribes as structured products under Section 392 of the SFO. The SFO's current definition of listed securities only includes securities listed on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange at the time of the dealing in question. In order to catch grey market dealings prior to a secondary issue of securities, the definition of definition of listed securities also includes issued unlisted securities if at the time of the insider dealing it's reasonably foreseeable that they will be listed and they are subsequently in fact listed and unissued securities provided that at the time of the insider dealing it's reasonably foreseeable that they will be issued and listed and they are subsequently in fact issued and listed. Securities that have been suspended from trading are also treated as listed. Insider dealing involving securities that are listed on foreign exchanges and are not dual listed in Hong Kong and overseas is not currently covered as insider dealing under the SFO. This is because the insider dealing offences cover dealings in listed securities, which are defined as securities listed on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. The Hong Kong courts have therefore relied instead on the offence of using fraudulent or deceptive devices in transactions in securities futures contracts or leveraged forex trading under Section 300 of the SFO in cases where the securities in question are listed outside Hong Kong. The key case on the applicability of Section 300 to insider dealing in overseas listed shares is the 2018 case of the SFC against Young, Bic, Fung and others. The case involved two Hong Kong solicitors, Betty and Eric, who were found guilty of illegally profiting from dealings based on inside information relating to shares listed in Taiwan. The facts were that Betty had been seconded by a law firm to a Hong Kong bank to assist with the bank's takeover by way of tender offer of Sin Chu International Bank, which was listed on the Taiwan Stock Exchange. The two banks conducted confidential negotiations in August and September 2006 and the tender offer was announced on the 29th of September 2006. Betty was aware of the tender offer and the proposed offer price before the announcement was made, and the court found that information to be confidential, price-sensitive information in relation to Shinshu Bank. On the 20th of September 2006, a sister of one of the solicitors opened a securities account with a Hong Kong broker, and the defendants each injected substantial sums into that account, between the 21st and the 29th of September, raising the funds through loans, overdrafts and liquidating portions of their investment portfolios. The sister purchased just over 1.5 million shares in Sinchu Bank before the announcement of the tender offer. She then accepted the tender offer for all the shares and distributed the profits of around 2.69 million Hong Kong dollars to the other defendants pro rata to their contributions. 
Given the extraterritorial nature of this case, the court relied on Section 300 of the SFO, which prohibits fraudulent or deceptive schemes and transactions involving securities. As the securities involved were listed in Taiwan, the defendant's conduct was outside the scope of Hong Kong's insider dealing regime. However, since the offer to buy the securities was made in Hong Kong, the court held that Section 300 applied. The court also accepted that the sister's acceptance of the tender offer in Hong Kong would have brought the case within the scope of Section 300. The court held that Betty's conduct, misusing material price-sensitive information and knowingly breaching the dealing restrictions that applied to her, amounted to a scheme or act of deception under Section 300. The Court of Final Appeal upheld the court's ruling, saying that Section 300 could be applied in respect of securities listed outside of Hong Kong, provided substantial activities constituting the crime occurred within Hong Kong, which they did in this case. As I'll cover later, under the amendments that are going to be made to the SFO, the SFO's insider dealing provisions will be extended to include insider dealing carried out in Hong Kong with respect to securities that are listed on overseas stock markets or their derivatives. This means that in future, cases like the Young Big Fung case can be dealt with under the insider dealing regime and courts will not have to resort to relying on Section 300. As I'll discuss later, the definition of listed securities will be extended under the upcoming amendments to the SFO to include overseas listed derivatives and securities. A person connected with a company, that is to say an insider, is someone who is on the inside track who has access to information about a company by reason of their relationship with it. Under sections 247 and 287, an individual is regarded as connected with a company if they are a director, shadow director, an employee, or a substantial shareholder, that is, someone holding 5% or more of the voting shares of that company or a related corporation. A person will also be connected with a company if their position may reasonably be expected to give them access to inside information about the company by virtue of a professional or business relationship between the person or their employer, a company of which the person is a director or a firm of which they are a partner, and that company, a related corporation or an officer or substantial shareholder in either company, or the person being a director, employee or partner of a substantial shareholder of the company or a related corporation. A person will also be considered to be connected with a company if they have access to inside information by virtue of being connected within the meaning I just talked about with another company and the inside information relates to a transaction or contemplated transaction involving both companies or involving one of them and the listed securities of the other or their derivatives or to the fact that the transaction is no longer contemplated. Finally, a person will also be regarded as connected with a company if they would have been deemed to be connected in any of the ways I just described at any time in the six months before any relevant dealing. A company is regarded as connected with another company if any of its directors or employees are so connected. Under sections 248 and 288 of the SFO, any public officer, member or employee of certain bodies, for example, LegCo, who in their capacity as such obtains inside information about a company, will be deemed to be connected with that company. So the term corporation is defined to include the large number of overseas incorporated companies that are listed on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. What are related corporations? Well, two or more companies are regarded as related corporations of each other if one of them is the holding company of the other, a subsidiary of the other, or a subsidiary of the other company's holding company. Companies are also regarded as related if the same individual controls the composition of the board of directors or controls more than half of the voting power at general meetings of two or more companies. They are also regarded as related if the same individual holds more than half of the issued share capital of two or more companies. However, holdings of shares which carry no right to participate beyond a specified amount on a distribution of profits or capital in more than one company will not make two companies related corporations. Inside information in relation to a company is defined in Section 2451 of the SFO as specific information about the company, 
a shareholder or officer of the company or the company's listed securities or their derivatives, which is not generally known to the persons who are accustomed or would be likely to deal in the company's listed securities, but which would, if it were generally known to them, be likely to materially affect the price of the listed securities. Inside information can, for example, include information about changes in a company's shareholders or officers and about the rights attaching to listed securities and derivatives over those securities. The same definition of inside information applies to Hong Kong listed companies' obligation to publicly announce inside information under Part 14a of the SFO. Looking at the requirements for information to be categorised as inside information, the first requirement is that the information must be specific, which means that it must be capable of being identified, defined and unequivocally expressed. In the case of First Stone International Holdings Limited, it was determined that information will not be, will be specifically specific, sufficiently specific if it carries with it such particulars as to a transaction event or matter or proposed transaction event or matter, so as to allow that transaction event or matter to be identified and its nature to be coherently described and understood. However, information does not need to be precise in order to be specific. According to the SFC guidelines on disclosure of inside information, it's not necessary that all particulars or details of the transaction event or matter are precisely known. Information may still be specific, even if it has a vague quality and may be broad and allow room, even substantial room, for further particulars. For instance, information that a company is having a financial crisis would be regarded as specific, as would contemplating a forthcoming share placing, even if the details are not known. Specific information, however, needs to be distinguished from mere rumours, vague hopes and worries and unsubstantiated conjecture which do not amount to inside information. For information to constitute inside information, it must be information that is not generally known to the market, that is not generally known by the persons who are accustomed or would be likely to deal in the company's listed securities. Rumours or media speculation relating to a company does not mean that the event information is generally known, and this is a distinction which the SFC has noted. Information relating to a company that appears in the media, analyst research reports, or electronic subscription databases can't be assumed to be information that's generally known to the market, even where media reports are widely circulated. In determining whether this kind of information is generally known, it's necessary to consider not only how widely the information is disseminated, but also the accuracy and completeness of the information and whether the market can rely on that information. In determining whether inside information is generally known, the question to ask is whether the sources contain all the information the company would need to disclose as inside information under Section 307b3 of the SFO, so that there are no material omissions which could make the disclosure false or misleading. The other question to determine is whether the market will realise that the information in those sources reflects the information known to the company, and whether the information will be regarded as speculation or the opinion of persons outside the company. If the information known to the market is incomplete or there are material omissions or doubts as to its bona fides, the information cannot be considered to be generally known. Information that's likely to have a material effect on the price of the listed securities. While well, Section 2451 requires that inside information must be information which would, if it were generally known to the wider investing public, to be likely to materially affect the price of the listed securities. This means that the information must affect the price of the listed securities. It's not sufficient for the price-sensitive information to merely affect the price of the securities. It must have a material effect on the securities price. According to the SFC guidelines on inside information, information that's likely materially to affect the price of a company's securities is information which may well materially affect the price. That is to say, it has to be more likely than less likely that the price will be affected materially. The standard by which materiality is judged is whether the information on the particular share would influence persons 
who would be likely to deal in the share in deciding whether or not to buy or sell it. The test of whether the information is likely to materially affect the price is necessarily a hypothetical one since it has to be applied at the time the information becomes available. There are no fixed thresholds of price movements or quantitative criteria that can determine the materiality of a price movement. Volatility of blue chip shares is typically less than that of small, less liquid stocks, and blue chip securities usually move within ranges narrower than those of small stocks. Hence, smaller percentage movements may be material for large company stocks. While the actual magnitude of the share price movement, once the information becomes publicly known, indicates the extent of the probable change the information might have caused, this is not conclusive. It's possible that the actual price change once the information is released is moderate due to the mixed impact of the information released and other extraneous factors. Further, a material price movement may have been preempted by the fact that the share price has already declined substantially in the period leading up to the release of the information. Under Section 249 of the SFO, a person deals whether they act as principal or agent. Agreeing to deal and buying or selling the right to deal will also be dealings under the SFO. So what is not insider dealing? While well, the available defences include the situation where a person dealt or counselled or procured a dealing for the sole purpose of acquiring qualifying shares as a director or intending director of a company. A person will also have a defence if they acted in good faith in performing obligations under an underwriting agreement with respect to the listed securities or derivatives, or as a liquidator, receiver, or trustee in bankruptcy. A company such as an investment bank or sponsor firm will have a defence if it can demonstrate that it had effective arrangements in place, that is, Chinese walls, to ring fence any inside information possessed by its directors and employees, and that each person who took the decision for the company to deal, counsel or procure a dealing in the listed securities or derivatives in question did not have the inside information at that time and had not received advice from those in possession of such information. A person will have a defence if the purpose for which they dealt in or counselled or procured another to deal in the listed securities or their derivatives or disclosed information did not include the purpose of securing or increasing a profit or avoiding or reducing a loss whether for himself or another, by using the inside information. A defence is also available to someone who dealt or counselled or procured another to deal in a company's listed securities or their derivatives as agent, provided that they did not select or advise on the selection of the listed securities or their derivatives, and they did not know that the person for whom they acted was connected with that company or had the inside information. It's a defence if the dealing occurred off-market in Hong Kong, and the person dealing in the listed securities or their derivatives and the other party entered into the dealing directly with each other, and at the time of the dealing, the other party knew or ought reasonably to have known of the inside information. Where a person cancelled or procured another person to deal in listed securities or their derivatives, that person will have a defence if they cancelled or procured the other party to enter into the dealing directly with them, and at that time the other party knew or ought reasonably to have known of the inside information. It's a defence where a person dealt in listed securities or their derivatives but did not counsel or procure the other party to deal if at the time of the dealing the other party knew or ought reasonably to have known that such person was a person connected with the company. This defence operates on the assumption that people who transact with someone they know or should know is a company insider, should be on notice that the other party may be insider dealing and so should make adequate inquiries with the insider before dealing with them and maybe negotiate terms as to the disclosure of inside information. A person will have a defence if they counselled or procured another person to deal in listed securities or their derivatives and they can establish that the other party did not counsel or procure the other party to the dealing to deal in the listed securities or their derivatives. If at the time the person counselled or procured the other person to deal, the other party to the dealing knew or ought reasonably to have known that the person was a person connected. 
This gives a defence to a person who counsels or procures someone to deal in the same circumstances as a defence is available to a person who deals in the circumstances I've just described. It's really a logical extension of that defence and would, for example, protect an investment bank who introduced a prospective purchaser to a substantial shareholder of a listed company who the bank thought might want to tender or sell their shareholding where it advised the shareholder on the sale. A defence is available to a person who deals or counsels or procures another person to deal in a company's listed securities or their derivatives, where the person acted in connection with any dealing that was under consideration, or the subject of negotiation, or in the course of a series of dealings, and with a view to facilitating the dealing or the series of dealings, and the inside information was market information arising directly out of their involvement in the dealing or the series of dealings. Market information is defined to include information consisting of one or more of certain facts that there has, has or is to be or has not been or will not be a dealing in listed securities or their derivatives or that any such dealing is under consideration or negotiation. The quantity and price or price range of the listed securities or their derivatives and the identity of the people involved. This gives a defence to someone who trades with knowledge of their own trading intentions or activities, and also to those who simply execute or facilitate a trade on their behalf. This defence covers the situation in which a person whose trading activities might be price sensitive, for example, a substantial shareholder and therefore a connected person increases their stake in a listed company. Without such an explicit defence, a person dealing with inside information about their own trading activities would be technically insider dealing. Dealing subject to the rules of a recognised clearinghouse has the benefit of a defence where the deal is entered into by the clearinghouse with a clearing participant for the purposes of the clearing and settlement of a market transaction. Sections 272 and 293 provide a further defence where a trustee or personal representative deals in, or counsels or procures a dealing in, listed securities or their derivatives, on advice obtained in good faith from an appropriate person who did not appear to them to be a person who would have been involved in insider dealing, if such person had dealt in the listed securities or their derivatives. Sections 273 and 294 also provide a defence, where a person deals in listed securities or their derivatives, in exercising a right to subscribe for or otherwise acquire the securities or their derivatives, where that right was granted to them or was derived from securities held by them before the person became aware of any inside information. I'm going to look now at the landmark case on the so-called innocent purpose defence under section 2713 of the SFO. That is the October 2018 decision in the SFC against Yu, Hoi, Ying, Charles and others. This was a court of final appeal decision which found in favour of the SFC and related to insider dealing by Mr Yu and Ms Wong in the shares of Asia Telemedia, of which they held 6 million and 10 million shares each. The facts were that Asia Telemedia owed 58.08 million to a company called Goodpine Limited. In April 2007, Goodpine Limited served a statutory demand on Asia Telemedia and said that it would issue a winding up petition against it if the debt was not repaid within 21 days. This information was known to Mr. Yu and Ms. Wong, but was not announced to the public. At the same time, Asia Telemedia sh shares experienced a price surge. Mr. Yu took advantage of the price rise by selling all his shares in May 2007, making a net profit of 5.3 million. Ms. Wong sold her shares between February and June 2007, making a net profit of 5.1 million Hong Kong dollars. The SFC alleged in the market misconduct tribunal proceedings that the respondent's knowledge of Goodpine Limited's statutory demand to ATML constituted inside information and that they engaged in insider dealing when they relied on that information to dispose of their ATML shares at a profit. Mr. Yu and Ms. Wong relied on the innocent purpose defence, claiming that the reason for their disposals was the speculative surge in Asia Telemedia's share price at the time and not their knowledge of the inside information. 
That's to say their knowledge of Good Pine Limited's statutory demand for repayment of its loan and its threat to wind up the company if it was not repaid. They said that they believed Asia Telemedia's financial situation would be dealt with behind closed doors eventually and would not influence the market. The MMT and the Court of Appeal accepted that defence. However, the Court of Final Appeal rejected that defence in a 4-1 to one decision for the SFC. Whether Mr Yu and Ms Wong could rely on the defence turned on what constitutes use of the inside information. The Court of Final Appeal reasoned that using inside information means turning the possession of inside information into action. It considered the mere withholding or non-disclosure of inside information to be insufficient to show use of the inside information. The inside information had to be exploited for financial advantage. The respondents knew that the price of the ATML shares was artificially high because of the inside information they possessed, and they disposed of the shares to profit from that knowledge. The court's ruling seems to suggest that officers of a listed company who have inside information, which is not publicly known when they deal in the company's securities, may be considered to be using the inside information and that the innocent purpose defence may not be available to them. The court considered the respondent's belief as to what might happen in the future, that is, that Asia Telemedia's financial situation would be dealt with behind closed doors and would not impact the share price to be irrelevant. Accordingly, the defence does not apply if the inside information played a role in the decision-making, regardless of how big or small a role the inside information had in the decision-making process. What mattered was whether the elements of insider dealing were satisfied and whether the defence was applicable when the transaction took place. The implications of the judgment are that officers of listed companies who possess inside information should avoid dealing in the company's shares until the inside information has been publicly announced. The case was remitted to the MMT to deal with the question of appropriate sanctions on the basis that Mr Yu and Ms Wong had been found culpable of market misconduct. The MMT's various orders against Mr Yu and Ms Wong included a three-year disqualification order against Mr Yu and an HKICS disciplinary referral order against Ms Wong. Three-year cold shoulder orders, cease and desist orders, disgorgement orders and government and SFC costs orders were also imposed on both Mr Yu and Ms Wong. I'll talk about MMT proceedings and the orders that can be imposed shortly. Looking now at the consequences of insider dealing, the SFO creates dual civil and criminal insider dealing regimes. The MMT conducts civil proceedings and, where appropriate, imposes civil sanctions. The MMT is an independent body whose chairman is appointed by Hong Kong's chief executive, who sits with two members who are prominent members of Hong Kong's business and professional community, appointed by the financial secretary under the authority delegated by the chief executive. It's inquisitorial in nature and is entitled to direct that the SFC carry out further investigations and report its findings to the MMT. Under the SFO, the presenting officer is a lawyer whose role is to present evidence to the MMT, who must be independent. The presenting officer acts more like a prosecuting counsel than a counsel assisting the tribunal. Section 252 of the SFO allows the SFC to institute proceedings before the MMT if it considers that market misconduct has or may have taken place. The purpose of MMT proceedings is to determine whether any market misconduct has taken place, the identity of those who have engaged in market misconduct, and the amount of any profit gained or loss avoided as a result of the market misconduct. The MMT can identify a person as having engaged in insider dealing if they conducted any insider dealing, or if insider dealing was committed by a company of which they are an officer with their consent or connivance. A person can also be found to have engaged in insider dealing if another person engaged in insider dealing and they assisted or connived with that person in committing insider dealing, knowing that the conduct constituted or might constitute insider dealing. The MMT makes its findings on the civil standard of proof and therefore needs to be satisfied that a person has engaged in insider dealing on the balance of probabilities rather than beyond reasonable doubt, which is the criminal standard of proof. 
The MMT has powers to receive any evidence, whether or not the evidence would be admissible in civil or criminal proceedings, and has wide powers to compound the giving of evidence and to prevent the publication of information about the evidence it receives. A person is not excused from complying with an MMT requirement to give evidence on the ground that to do so might incriminate him, section 2534, and compelled self-incriminatory evidence can be considered by the MMT. This was seen in the case of SFC against Cheng Chak Nyok and another in September 2018, in which the SFC had appealed against the MMT's decision that Mr. Cheng had not engaged in insider dealing and shares of China gas holdings. The Court of Appeal allowed the appeal and examined certain principles. Mr. Cheng was the executive director, chief financial officer and company secretary of ENN Energy Holdings Limited, which in 2011 considered acquiring China gas. China Petroleum and Chemical Corporation, Sinopec, agreed to form a consortium with ENN to finance the acquisition. Mr. Cheng had responsibility for negotiating the financial proposal for ENN. He obtained information regarding the consortium formed to finance the acquisition, the timing of the announcement of the general offer, and the offer price. The SFC considered that insider dealing had been committed by Mr. Cheng when he used a third-party securities account to purchase China Gas shares immediately prior to its suspension of share trading before the announcement of the general offer. He made a profit of approximately 3 million Hong Kong dollars when he later sold the shares. However, on the available evidence, the MMT decided that it was not satisfied on a balance of probabilities that Mr. Cheng had dealt in China gas shares at the material times. Consequently, insider dealing could not be proved. The SFC appealed against that decision. The Court of Appeal noted that the nature of the MMT's inquiry on market misconduct is civil and inquisitorial. This means that the judge has an examining or inquiring role in investigating the facts, rather than the impartial role of the judge in an an, an accusatorial system. The function of the MMT is to inquire into the question of insider dealing, not to decide between competing positions or claims. MMT proceedings are therefore inquisitorial. As the nature of inquiry by the MMT is civil, the standard of proof is on a balance of probabilities. Case law establishes that the standard of proof will be proportional to the seriousness of the allegations. In other words, the more serious the allegation, the more compelling the evidence required. The concept of burden of proof is only relevant in adversarial proceedings. In inquisitorial proceedings, no party has the burden of proof. The SFC specified four grounds of appeal. The first ground was that the MMT had erred in law in misdirecting itself that the inquiry was adversarial in nature, misdirecting itself that the burden of proof applied and rested with the SFC and failing to exercise its investigative powers under the SFO. The SFC's second ground was that the MMT had applied a criminal standard of proof which required the SFC to prove the case beyond reasonable doubt and apply evidential principles applicable to criminal proceedings in evaluating the evidence. The third ground was that the MMT erred in concluding that it could not be satisfied that Mr. Chang had engaged in insider dealing on a balance of probabilities. And the fourth ground was that the MMT failed to exercise its investigative powers under the SFO before concluding the inquiry. On the issue of the applicable standard of proof, the Court of Appeal found that the MMT had not properly evaluated the available evidence and was wrong in applying the criminal standard of proof. The MMT accepted that Mr. Cheng's evidence was confusing and suspicious, but insisted on the SFC providing more compelling evidence to prove the case. The Court found that the MMT had erred in requiring the SFC to prove the case on the basis of the criminal standard of proof. The Court of Appeal also found that the MMT had incorrectly imposed the burden of proof on the SFC. The Court of Appeal said that no burden of proof needs to be imposed in an inquisitorial inquiry and that in MMT proceedings, the SFC is only required under the SFO to present evidence and information to the MMT, which should investigate the facts to reach a decision on the balance of probabilities. 
The Court of Appeal allowed the SFC's appeal and remitted the matter to a differently constituted tribunal to determine the sole question of whether Mr Cheng had dealt in the shares. The other elements of market misconduct had been established and were not challenged in the appeal. In the MMT retrial in November 2020, the MMT concluded that on the basis of the evidence, it was more probable than not that Mr Cheng dealt in China gas shares. In making its determination, the MMT considered that Mr Chang's evidence was unreliable and that he did not give a coherent, cogent, complete or credible account. The MMT attached no weight to his evidence. The MMT also took into account evidence that the securities accounts were opened with the assistance of Mr Chang and that he made arrangements to receive all correspondence and statements relating to the securities accounts. The MMT considered the evidence that there was a clear correlation between the trading of the China gas shares and the acquisition of inside information by Mr. Chang. It was also considered that there was a correlation between Mr. Chang's whereabouts and the sources of the orders placed to trade the shares. The MMT found that neither a third party nominee nor an unidentified individual would have been in a position to place the orders. The MMT therefore determined that Mr. Chang had engaged in insider dealing. In June, 2021, the MMT made various orders against Mr. Cheng, including a 54-month disqualification order, a 54-month cold shoulder order, a cease and desist order, a disgorgement order in the amount of almost 3 million Hong Kong dollars, government and SFC costs orders, and an HKI CPA disciplinary referral order. At the end of any proceedings, the MMT can, under subsection 2571 of the SFO, impose a range of sanctions on anyone found to have committed market misconduct, including a disqualification order, cold shoulder order, cease and desist order, disgorgement order, costs order, or a disciplinary referral. The SFC can also fine regulated persons. The MMT can take account, can take into account any previous convictions in Hong Kong, any previous findings of market misconduct by the MMT and any previous findings of insider dealing under the predecessor ordinance, the Securities Insider Dealing Ordinance. Failure to comply with a disqualification, cold shoulder or cease and desist order is a criminal offence, punishable by a maximum fine of 1 million Hong Kong dollars and or up to two years in prison. In addition, sections 2532 and 2546 prescribe a penalty of a maximum fine of 1 million Hong Kong dollars and a maximum of two years imprisonment for failure to comply with various requirements of the MMT or disrupting its proceedings. The conduct referred to in those sections and in sections 25710 and 25810 is also liable to be punished as contempt under section 261. Any person who's dissatisfied with a finding or determination of the MMT can appeal to the Court of Appeal, but only in respect of a point of law or with the leave of the Court of Appeal on a question of fact. Under the SFO, a party is not satisfied with certain decisions of the SFC can appeal to the Securities and Futures Appeal Tribunal. The SFC and the Securities and Futures Appeal Tribunal proceedings are civil in nature and use the civil standard of proof, except for charges of contempt, although it's been recognised that the civil threshold may approach or even be identical to the criminal standard if the potential penalty can lead to loss of liberty. However, generally, the standard of proof in disciplinary proceedings relating to offences that are not generally applicable to the public, but only to a limited group of individuals, such as licensed persons, will not be criminal. In the case of China Huiyuan Juice Group Limited, Ms. Sun Min was prosecuted for buying around 8.6 million shares of China Huiyuan Juice Group Limited a mainland Chinese fruit drinks producer listed on the main board of the Hong Kong Stock Exchange on six different occasions through four different companies ahead of its announcement that it would be acquired by Coca-Cola. Ms. Sun, the owner of a shipping business, made a profit in excess of 55 million Hong Kong dollars when she sold all her shares in the company within 48 hours after the public announcement of the Coca-Cola takeover. Ms. Sun had close connections with the management of the company, but there was no direct evidence proving that she received inside information on the Coca-Cola takeover. She denied having any inside information or knowledge of the takeover. 
The SFC's case against us centred on the circumstantial evidence and inferences from handwritten notes on the Coca-Cola takeover found in Ms. Sun's secretary's diary, which were taken in a meeting between Ms. Sun, her husband, her secretary, and the COO of Ms. Sun's shipping company. The SFC was unable to identify which connected person was the source of the inside information. The secretary was unable to recall how the information was coll collected or whether it was passed to her employer. The MMT held that if the identity of the connected person who passed on the inside information could not be ascertained, the MMT would decide, based on all available evidence, whether a compelling inference could be drawn that the inside information must have come from an unidentified connected person and that Miss Sun must have known of that fact. The information did not constitute a mere rumour and was fact-specific. Some of the handwritten notes in the diary concerned mainland Chinese antitrust law. The MMT considered that an ordinary investor would not have considered PRC antitrust law issues unless they knew of the potential Coca-Cola takeover. On that basis, the MMT inferred that the information came from an insider, even though the insider's identity couldn't be ascertained. The MMT also considered that the inside information in the diary must have come from Ms. Sun, or she must have known of the information. Absent any reasonable reason that would have been passed on in the normal course of events, the MMT therefore rejected the secretary's evidence that she was unsure whether she'd passed on the information to Ms. Sun. The Waterley case involved the former company secretary, Lowe, who held around 1.6 million Waterley shares purchased in late 2003 and early 2004, and a lender and potential investor in Waterley, Lou, who held around 50 million Waterley shares through three nominees. In mid-2006, Wardley encountered cash flow problems and both Lowe and Lou sold their shares in batches in late March and April 2007. The SFC alleged that Lowe and Lou engaged in insider dealing in Wardley shares because at the time they sold the shares, they were in possession of price-sensitive information regarding Wardley's poor financials, which were not publicly known. In selling the shares, they avoided incurring a loss. The SFC alleged that certain events were inside information. These included the tightening of banking facilities from July 2006 and events such as overdue loans, rescheduled payments and the issue of demand letters and writs by the company's banks and lenders. The inside information also included a Hong Kong dollar 2 million loan to Waterley made by Liu in November 2006 at a 5% monthly interest rate. Further loans from Lou totaling 7.2 million Hong Kong dollars at an interest rate of 5% in December 2006. Waterley's failure to repay the loans and interest due to Lou when they became due in January 2007 and or a 10 million Hong Kong dollar loan from Mr. Lou in February 2007 that carried an interest rate of 3% per month and was secured by 50 million Waterley shares. The main question before the MMT was whether the five specified events constituted inside information. The MMT held that the information regarding Waterley's poor financials was already known to the public as its dire financial state was already disclosed in its annual report of August 2006 and its interim report for the six months ended 31st October 2006. The writs for the unrepaid loans were also in the public domain, which had no adverse impact on the stock price. The information was therefore not relevant, and Lowe and Lou were held not to have engaged in insider dealing. The Waterley case shows that a connected person dealing in listed stocks while in possession of price-sensitive insider information does not always constitute insider dealing. Whether insider dealing has taken place or not is fact-specific. Turning now to criminal liability, all forms of market misconduct, including insider dealing, are liable to prosecution as a criminal offence under Part 14 of the SFO and are potentially subject to a maximum penalty of 10 years imprisonment and a fine of up to 10 million Hong Kong dollars. The court can also make disqualification, cold shoulder and disciplinary referral orders. Non-compliance of with any of these is an offence punishable by a maximum fine of 1 million Hong Kong dollars and up to two years imprisonment. 
A person will not be subject to the double jeopardy of both civil proceedings under Part 13 and criminal proceedings under Part 14 for the same conduct. The SFO provides that a person who's been subject to criminal proceedings under Part 14 cannot be subject to MMT proceedings if those proceedings are still pending or if no further criminal prosecution could be brought against that person again under Part 14 in respect of the same conduct and vice versa. The decision as to whether to take civil or criminal proceedings in relation to suspected market misconduct is made by the Secretary for Justice based on two criteria, there being sufficient evidence and the proceedings being in the public interest. The SFC can also institute summary criminal proceedings before a magistrate for less serious market misconduct offences, although the Secretary for Justice is able to intervene in the SFC's conduct of any such proceedings. Civil liability and the right of private action. So sections 281 and 305 of the SFO provide a private right of civil action against anyone who has committed market misconduct or an offence under Part 14 of the SFO in favour of anyone who's suffered a pecuniary loss as a result. However, that right only exists if it's fair, just and reasonable for the perpetrator to be liable. Under the SFO, someone is taken to have committed market misconduct if they've carried out any market misconduct, or if a company of which they are an officer carried out the market misconduct with their consent or connivance, or if any other person committed market misconduct and they assisted or connived with that person in carrying out the market misconduct, knowing that that conduct constituted or might constitute market misconduct. There is no need for there to have been a finding of market misconduct by the MMT or a criminal conviction under Part 14 before civil proceedings are started. Findings of the MMT are, however, admissible in the civil proceedings as prima facie evidence that the market misconduct took place or that a person engaged in market misconduct and a criminal conviction constitutes conclusive evidence that the person committed the offence. The courts are able to impose injunctions in addition to or in substitution for damages. Sections 280 and 304 of the SFO provide that a transaction is not void or voidable by reason only that it constitutes market misconduct. Section 279 of the SFO imposes a duty on all officers of a listed company to take reasonable measures to ensure that proper safeguards exist to prevent it from carrying out any market misconduct. The definition of an officer includes a director, including a shadow director, and any person occupying the position of a director, a manager or secretary of, or any other person involved in the management of the listed company. This could, in principle, cover supervisors, and anyone else with management responsibilities. Under text section 258 of the SFO, if a company is identified as having been engaged in market misconduct and the market misconduct is directly or indirectly attributable to a breach by anyone as an officer of the company, of the duty imposed on them under section 279, the MMT can make one or more of the orders I talked about before in relation to that person even if that person has not been identified as having engaged in market misconduct themselves. Anyone who suffers pecuniary loss as a result of market misconduct has a right of civil action to seek compensation. Under Section 390 of the SFO, where it's proved that an offence committed under Part 14 was aided, abetted, counselled, procured or induced by or committed with the consent or connivance of or attributable to the recklessness of any officer of the company or any person purporting to act in that capacity, that person as well as the company is guilty of the offence and liable to be punished accordingly. Under Part 9 of the SFO, any regulated person who is guilty of misconduct or who, in the opinion of the SFC, is not a fit and proper person to be or to remain the same type of regulated person is subject to a widened range of disciplinary procedures. Misconduct is defined to include any contravention of the SFO or of the terms of any licensed issued or registration made under it. The SFC can revoke or suspend someone's license in respect of all or any part of the regulated activities for which they're licensed, or can impose a fine um, not exceeding the greater of 10 million Hong Kong dollars or three times the amount of the profit gained or loss avoided 
by the regulated person as a result of their misconduct or such other conduct which led to the SFC's opinion that such person is not fit and proper. The SFC can also impose prohibition orders preventing an offending person from applying to be registered or licensed under the SFO, amongst other things. Approvals granted to responsible officers can also be suspended or revoked. People covered by these provisions include corporations licensed under the SFO, their responsible officers and persons involved in their management. Authorised financial institutions, which have to be registered with the SFC to conduct regulated activities, for example, securities dealing, asset management, their executive officers, people involved in the management of their regulated business and individuals named in their register as carrying out a regulated activity are also subject to the SFC's disciplinary regime. I'm now going to talk about Section 213 of the SFO, which allows the SFC to apply to the Court of First Instance for various orders aimed at preventing or remedying breaches of the SFO and other relevant ordinances. The SFC has come to rely on this provision quite a bit in recent years. First, as a means of protecting the assets of those suspected of market misconduct to ensure that those assets will be available to compensate investors for their losses resulting from the misconduct. Section 213 has also been used by the SFC as a means of obtaining financial compensation for investors through the grant of so-called restoration orders, which are orders for the wrongdoer to put the counterparties to its transactions back in the same position they were in before entering into the transactions. The court can make an order under section 213 against a person who has contravened a relevant provision or any other person who has aided, abetted or assisted in that person's contravention of a relevant provision or induced a person to commit the contravention or been knowingly involved in directly or indirectly or a party to the contravention. Section 213 is remedial in nature and is concerned with handling the adverse consequences of actual or potential market misconduct. Proceedings are standalone proceedings are, and are intended to provide remedies to protect the interests of those involved in the relevant transactions. The orders that the Court of First Instance can grant include injunctions and orders requiring the person to take steps to res restore the parties to a transaction to the position they were in before the transaction or restraining or prohibiting a person from acquiring, disposing of, or dealing in any property. In order to provide compensation to investors, the court will often grant so-called restoration orders, which require the wrongdoer to put investors back in the position they were in before the transaction was entered into. The court's power to make an order is subject to a requirement that it considers the order to be desirable and that no one will be unfairly prejudiced by the order. The landmark case on Section 213 and its use to grant compensation to investors is the SFC against Tiger Asia. This confirmed the power of the Court of First Instance to make orders sought by the SFC under Section 213 on the basis of insider dealing or other market misconduct without there having been a prior finding of insider dealing by the Market Misconduct Tribunal or a criminal court. Tiger Asia was a US-based hedge fund manager which received confidential and price-sensitive information regarding upcoming placements of the shares of China Construction Bank and Bank of China. Tiger Asia then took short positions in the shares of the two banks before the placings were publicly announced, making a substantial notional profit. Tiger Asia also manipulated China Construction Bank's share price downward during the closing auction session. The court imposed an injunction freezing the assets of Tiger Asia and three of its senior officers pending the grant of the final orders. It then ordered the unwinding of transactions between Tiger Asia and 1,800 sellers of the bank's shares and ordered Tiger Asia and two of its senior officers to pay around 45.3 million Hong Kong dollars to the sellers to restore them to the position they were in before they, they sold their shares to Tiger Asia. Tiger Asia and one of the officers was also banned from trading securities in Hong Kong for four years. This was the first time the SFC obtained a restoration order for insider dealers to compensate investors for losses as resulting from insider dealing. Since the Tiger Asia decision, Section 213 has been used by the SFC 
for obtaining investor compensation in insider dealing cases. Now moving to the case of the Hong Kong SAR against Du Jun. So another major case under Section 213 of the SFO was the 2009 case of the HKSR against Du Jun. Du Jun was a former managing director of Morgan Stanley and was convicted of insider dealing in China resources holding shares worth 86 million Hong Kong dollars during an acquisition. He was sentenced to six years imprisonment and fined 1.7 million Hong Kong dollars. In separate civil proceedings brought by the SFC under Section 213, the Court of First Instance first ordered the freezing of his assets and subsequently granted a restoration order requiring him to pay 23.9 million Hong Kong dollars to 237 investors who had sold shares to Du Jun to restore them to their pre-transaction positions. The court also banned Du Jun from being a director or managing director of a listed company and from dealing in securities in Hong Kong for five years. The case demonstrated that despite the double jeopardy provisions that prevent the bringing of both civil and criminal insider dealing proceedings, the SFC can pursue criminal proceedings for insider dealing and civil proceedings to obtain remedial orders under Section 213 of the SFO. I'm now going to look at the re Telly i Holdings Limited case, another case involving the making of a restoration order under Section 213 of the SFO to compensate investors. In November 2001, the Court of First Instance found that Ms. Yik and her two associates, Ms. Wei and Mr. Huang, had committed insider dealing in the shares of Teli-I, which is listed on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange, although it's now called Circutech International Holdings. In early 2016, Ms. Yik acted as the representative of Teli-I's controlling shareholder in negotiating a proposed takeover of Teli-I with the offeror. Between the 1st of March and the 12th of April 2016, Ms. Yik purchased shares in Teli-I through securities accounts held by Ms. Wei, who was Ms. Yik's niece, and Mr. Huang, who was married to Ms. Wei. Mr. Huang also purchased Teli-I shares through their securities account. Ms. Yik controlled all these accounts as she had authority to operate them. 22.7 million Teli-I shares were bought through the accounts. When the takeover was announced on the 14th of April 2016, Telei's share price rose over 70%. 15 million shares were then sold from the accounts, making a profit of nearly 13 million Hong Kong dollars. The SFC started civil proceedings against the three individuals under Section 213 of the SFO in September 2016. In 2017, the Court of First Instance granted a Moravia injunction over Ms. Yik's assets in Hong Kong up to over Hong Kong dollars 25 million, and Ms. Wei and Mr. Huang undertook to pay into court almost 13 million Hong Kong dollars, equivalent to the suspected profits made by the three dependent defendants in carrying out the insider dealing. In November 2021, the court convicted Ms. Yik of insider dealing. She was a person connected with Tali who had information which she knew was inside information in relation to Tali and had dealt in Tali listed shares. Ms. Yik was found to be a person connected with Tali as she acted as Tali representative in discussing the proposed takeover with representatives of the intended buyer. From late 2016, she also acted as the seller's representatives in the negotiations with the buyer's representatives and reported the progress of negotiations to the seller. Ms. Yik commented on the draft sale and purchase agreement and other draft documents, attended all meetings with the buyer's representatives and was copied on all emails concerning the draft sale and purchase agreement, the closing timetable and the price of the Tali-I shares. She was very much involved in the negotiations with the buyer and this gave her direct access to all inside information relating to the takeover at a time when that information was confined to the parties and was not publicly available. To constitute inside information, in information has to satisfy three components. The first and second components that the information was specific information about Tele I and its listed stocks and was not generally known to relevant investors were not in dispute. The third component, material price sensitivity, was also satisfied. The material impact on the company's share price was demonstrated by investors' reaction to the announcement of the takeover. There was ample evidence that Ms. Yik knew that the subject information was inside information at the relevant time, 
She was informed of the definition of inside information in the training she was given on insider dealing in September 2015. Ms. Yick had also asked the buyer's representative to provide a non-disclosure agreement for her consideration, and the agreement made clear that the buyer had to keep confidential the information about the proposed takeover. The draft joint announcement circulated to Ms. Yick on the 7th of April 2016 also made clear that the subject information was confidential and would only be made public when the joint announcement was published. It was clear that Ms. Yick had dealt in Tellei's listed shares. She placed all the buy orders for Tellei's shares and, on the 1st of April 2016, she confirmed instructions to buy up to 5 million Tellei shares through the account of UOB K. Hian Hong Kong Limited. The court also found that two other defendants, Ms. Wei and Mr. Huang, had each committed the offence of insider dealing. They each dealt in Tellei's listed shares, despite having information which they knew was inside information relating to Tellei, which they received from Ms. Yik, someone they knew to be connected with Tellei, and who they knew or had reasonable cause to believe held the information as a result of being connected with Tellei. Based on the court's finding that the defendants had committed insider dealing, the Court of First Instance made restoration orders under Section 213 of the SFO, ordering the payment of almost 13 million Hong Kong dollars in illicit profits to 63 counterparties who had sold their Tellei shares to Ms. Wei or Mr. Huang. The order was a restoration order, restoring the transaction counterparties to their positions before they entered into the Tellei share sales. I'm now going to talk about some other insider dealing cases. In the case of Lun Pak Kung and Cash Financial Services Group, the SFC commenced criminal proceedings against Mr. Lun Pak Kung, a practicing solicitor in April 2019, in relation to suspected insider dealing in the shares of Hong Kong listed Cash Financial Services Group Limited in December 2014 and January 2015. Mr. Lun was a legal advisor to Oceanwide Holdings Hong Kong in relation to its proposed acquisition of a 44% interest in Cash Financial. The SFC alleged that he bought over 2 million shares in Cash Financial while in possession of inside information and then disposed of all the shares. He allegedly sold over 1.2 million shares following the announcement of the proposed acquisition, earning a profit of over 45,000 Hong Kong dollars. In April 2021, the Eastern Magistrates Court acquitted Mr. Lung, having found that the witnesses provided conflicting evidence and that it was not demonstrated beyond reasonable doubt that Mr. Lun knew the subject information was inside information. Next, Chao Chu Chi, China Automation. In, on the 17th of December 2020, the Eastern Magistrates Court convicted Mr. Chow, the company secretary of China Automation Group, of insider dealing in the company's shares. Mr. Chow was subsequently sentenced to 45 days imprisonment and fined $45,000. Mr. Chow became aware of a possible general offer and was instructed to arrange for the company's suspension of trading. He then purchased over 500,000 shares in the company through his wife's securities account before the suspension took effect. China Automation announced the possible general offer the following day, and when trading resumed, the share price rose over 18% from the previous closing price. Mr. Chow sold some of the China Automation shares, making a profit of over 7,000 Hong Kong dollars. The notional profit of the remaining unsold shares was 36,865 um, Hong Kong dollars. The SFC found that Mr. Chow had access to inside information by virtue of his position as company secretary and had used the information to profit from trading the company's shares, thereby gaining an unfair advantage in the market. Turning next to the case of the SFC against Mr. Chan. The case of the SFC against Chan Pak Ho Pablo provided guidance on sentencing in insider dealing cases. Mr. Chan was found guilty of insider dealing and was initially sentenced to 240 hours of community service and ordered to pay the SFC's investigation costs. The sentence was then reviewed and the Eastern Magistrates Court sentenced Mr. Chan to four months imprisonment and fined him $120,000. Mr. Chan appealed to the Court of First Instance and the original sentence was restored. The court said that the magistrate lacked jurisdiction to grant the application for a review of a sentence once Mr. Chan had lodged notice of appeal. In 2012, the Court of a Final 
appeal reversed that decision, stating that a pending appeal against one part of a magistrate's decision does not preclude renew of an, renew, review of another part of the decision. The, record, the court restored the sentence of four months imprisonment and fine. Um, Mr. Justice Robert Ribeiro clarified that appropriate sentencing in insider dealing cases is a custodial sentence and a fine to disgorge all profits made from the insider dealing. The SFC also took action in May 2023 in two cases involving insider dealing in the shares of listed companies going through privatizations. The first case involved the SFC starting MMT proceedings against a former executive deputy general manager of China City Bank International, Mr. Wu, for alleged insider dealing in the shares of main board listed Bloomage Biotech, which was being privatized. Mr. Wu was working for Citic on a loan to finance another company's offer to privatize the listed company. Before the privatization was made public, Mr. Wu purchased over a million of the listed company shares through his own and his wife's securities accounts. He subsequently sold nearly all the shares after the privatization was announced, making a profit of about 3 million Hong Kong dollars. The second case involved the SFC starting Section 213 proceedings against a manager at an investment bank, Ms. Sang and her friend, Mr. Kwok, in relation to their suspected insider dealing in the shares of IT Limited, a main board listed company. Ms. Tsang allegedly obtained inside information about the privatization and tipped off her friend. They then bought 2.8 million shares in the company through Quok's securities accounts. When the planned privatization was announced, the share price rose 44.8% and they immediately sold the shares, making a profit of over 4 million Hong Kong dollars. The SFC sought freezing orders over the assets of Ms. Tsang and Mr. Barry Quok under Section 213 of the SFO which were granted by the Court of First Instance in May 2023. In another case, in August 2022, the SFC issued a restriction notice to Bright Smart, an SFC licensed broker, freezing assets held in a client account, holding the proceeds of suspected insider dealing. The notice was issued under sections 204 and 205 of the SFO, which allow the SFC to issue a written notice prohibiting a licensed corporation from disposing of or dealing in any property it holds on behalf of its clients. Since Bright Spark was not the subject of the SFC's investigation into suspected insider dealing, the restriction notice did not affect Bright Smart's operations or its other clients. So he considered that the issue of the restriction notice was desirable and served the interests of the investing public, given that it prevented the dissipation of the proceeds of suspected insider dealing held in a bright smart client account. I'm now going to talk about the changes that will be made to the SFO to broaden the territorial scope of the insider dealing regime as provided for in the SFC's consultation conclusions on proposed amendments to the enforcement related provisions of the Securities and Futures Ordinance published on the 8th of August, 2023. Currently, the SFO's civil and criminal insider dealing regimes apply only to securities listed on a recognized stock exchange, that is, the stock market operated by the Hong Kong Stock Exchange and their derivatives. As I mentioned earlier, the insider dealing regime currently does not apply to securities that are only listed overseas or their derivatives, even if the insider dealing is carried out in Hong Kong. The current regime also does not explicitly apply to insider dealing involving Hong Kong listed securities or their derivatives, where the relevant conduct occurs outside of Hong Kong. The amendments to the SFO will therefore expand the insider dealing regime so that it covers both insider dealing conducted in Hong Kong in relation to securities listed on overseas stock markets and their derivatives, as well as insider dealing conducted outside of Hong Kong, if it involves any Hong Kong listed securities or their, der their derivatives. The SFO civil and criminal insider dealing provisions currently don't apply where the relevant securities are only listed outside of Hong Kong or their derivatives, even where the acts specified in sections 271 or 291 have occurred in Hong Kong. As I talked about earlier, the courts have dealt with cases of suspected insider dealing in Hong Kong of overseas listed securities or their derivatives by providing intelligence to the relevant overseas securities regulators or relying on the fraud or deception market misconduct provisions of the SFO, such as Section 300. In the Young Bic Fung case, which I discussed earlier, 
Two Hong Kong solicitors dealt in the shares of a company listed in Taiwan on the basis of inside information. Their conduct wasn't covered by the insider dealing provisions because the shares were not listed in Hong Kong. The SFC therefore obtained civil remedies against the defendants under Section 213 of the SFO, which the court granted on the basis of the defendants' breach of Section 300. One of the reasons for the SFC amending the SFO to extend it to insider dealing in overseas listed securities and their derivatives is that the nature and amount of relief available in Section 213 proceedings differs depending on whether the provisions breached are the insider dealing provisions or Section 300. For example, in the Young Bic Fung case, as Betty, a fiduciary, had defrauded or deceived her principals, her employer, the law firm, and its client, the Hong Kong Bank, the Section 213 restoration order granted based on the Section 300 contravention was to return the profits from the illicit trades to the bank. The bank was a victim of the fraud or deception. However, if the restoration order had been based on a contravention of the insider dealing provisions, Section 270 or 291, the order would have been calculated on the basis of restoring the affected investors impacted by the illicit trades to the position they were in before they entered into the share sales to the defendants. In another case, a Hong Kong licensed intermediary dealt in the securities of an overseas listed entity prior to the announcement um, of a placing exercise. The dealing occurred when the intermediary possessed inside information which had been provided by another Hong Kong-based licensed intermediary. Apart from the mechanics of trading, the acts relating to the offence occurred in Hong Kong. However, the SFC noted in its consultation paper that as it did not have adequate evidence to establish that the suspect had engaged in any fraudulent or deceptive acts in relation to the transactions, it couldn't take action under Section 300 of the SFO. This highlighted the very different elements of the Section 300 defence and those of the insider dealing prohibitions. Fraud and or deception are key elements of Section 300, but are not elements of the insider dealing prohibitions. Also, Section 300 is a criminal offence, and the criminal standard of proof applies. There's no civil equivalent provision under Part 13. The SFC is therefore proceeding with its proposed extension of the SFC Oh, insider dealing regime to cover any act of insider dealing which takes place in Hong Kong in relation to overseas listed securities or their derivatives. The amended provisions will also stipulate that the relevant misconduct must also be un unlawful in the relevant overseas jurisdiction. The SFO insider dealing provisions currently do not explicitly apply to insider dealing involving Hong Kong listed securities where the acts giving rise to a contravention of Section 270 or 291 have occurred outside of Hong Kong. Due to the lack of express provisions stipulating the territorial scope of the insider dealing regime in each individual case, the SFC applies the common law test of whether a substantial measure of the activities of the crime have taken place within Hong Kong to determine the territorial jurisdiction. According to the consultation paper, over 60% of the insider dealing cases handled by the SFC between 2017 and 2021 related to insider dealing carried out outside of Hong Kong involving Hong Kong listed securities. The SFC will therefore extend the SFO's insider dealing regime to cover any act of insider dealing which takes place outside of Hong Kong involving Hong Kong listed securities or their derivatives. Respondents to the consultation queried whether the amendments will apply the insider dealing provisions to over-the-counter transactions in overseas listed debt securities the SFC noted in the consultation conclusions that the amended provisions mean that the insider dealing provisions will apply to over-the-counter transactions in overseas listed debt securities in the same way that they currently apply to over-the-counter transactions in Hong Kong listed debt securities. And the SFC also noted that SFC licensed intermediaries will be required to report any breach of the insider dealing provisions to the SFC under Section 12.5 of the Code of Conduct Licensed intermediaries will need to submit a report to the SFC when they become aware of any suspected breach of the insider dealing provisions and to use their best endeavours to obtain the necessary data to include in their report to the SFC. So the SFC will therefore amend the definition of listed in sections 2452 and 2852 of the SFO to include, include overseas listed securities and their derivatives as well as Hong Kong listed securities and their derivatives. A new section will be added to expand the territorial scope of the insider de dealing regime to cover acts of insider dealing that involve Hong Kong listed securities irrespective of where they occur. 
Insider dealing in overseas listed securities or their derivatives will also constitute insider dealing if any one or more of the insider dealing acts occurs in Hong Kong and the conduct is also unlawful in the jurisdiction of the securities offshore listing. The SFC will also repeal sections 270 subsection 2 and section 291 subsection 7, which currently extend the scope of the insider dealing provisions to dealings in securities due listed in Hong Kong and overseas or their derivatives, as these sections will be redundant once dealing in overseas listed securities is brought within the scope of the SFO's insider dealing offences. The insider dealing provisions will also be amended so that section 271, subsection 5 of the SFO, which is the off-market dealings defence, will also be available in respect of insider dealing involving overseas listed securities or their derivatives. And the SFC will align the two formulations of the mens rea element for insider dealing, taking place through disclosure of inside information. As I touched on earlier, the mens rea or intention element of sections 272b and 2917b, which apply to dual listed securities and their derivatives, is satisfied where the person disclosing the inside information knows or has reasonable cause to believe that the other person to whom the information is disclosed or some other person will deal in the listed securities or their derivatives. On the other hand, the mens rea element of the other subsections of sections 270 and 291, which apply to securities listed only in Hong Kong and their derivatives, is satisfied where the person disclosing the inside information knows or has reasonable cause to believe that the that only the other person to whom the information is disclosed will deal in the listed securities or their derivatives. The formulation of the mens rea element that applies to Hong Kong listed securities or their derivatives is therefore narrower as it does not cover dealing by some other person. The SFC will therefore align the two formulations by adopting the broader formulation under sections 272b and 2917b. So that brings me to the end of this presentation. Thank you again for joining me, and I hope you enjoyed the webinar. Bye.